For much of this year, he's been the invisible man, sidelined by the pandemic as we were all swept up by waves of crisis. Anthony Albanese still wants to be the Prime Minister, but time might be running out for him to make his mark. Tonight, he's here to answer your questions on how he'd lead the country. He started rolling out policies for the next election. It could be next year. So can he reboot Labor? Can he make his party relevant? Can he keep his team united? And can Albo get you excited? You've got lots of questions tonight, so let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. Remember, you can stream us on iView and the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Uh, we welcome you to join the debate respectfully from home. Uh, before we get started, in the interest of balance, uh, we did ask the Federal Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, to join us this week to answer your many questions on the economy. He declined. We've also extended several invitations to the Prime Minister to come and answer your questions this year. He's yet to make himself available. But you're sending in terrific, terrific questions for our elected leaders, so we will keep trying to get them to come here and answer them. But right now, I'm very pleased to say that the opposition leader has agreed to be here tonight. Would you please welcome Mr Anthony Albanese. Now, I should point out you've agreed to answer anything and everything tonight. Nothing is off limits, including the specifics of your policies that you started to outline in your budget reply. Uh, we're after all potentially heading to an election next year. Uh, and we know how much you like music, so uh, Sarah Blasco is going to be here to perform at the end, which means that no matter how tough it gets... One of my you, constituents. You can't leave that seat. Uh, so Sarah Blasco is coming up uh, later in the program. We plan to get to as many of your questions as possible, so let's get started. Our first tonight comes from Robin Cantali in the studio. Thanks, Hamish. Australia's recent political history has example after example of MPs being caught out for misconduct in their personal lives, some correctly and some incorrectly represented in the media. Do you believe that Premier Berejiklian will be judged differently, specifically more harshly, than that of her male counterparts, should they be in the same position because of her gender? Will her strong track record of leadership be jeopardised by today's revelations and do you believe this is fair? And, of course, we're talking about the revelations of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. Look, I, I certainly hope that Gladys is not judged on any of her personal life. Uh, I wish her nothing but happiness in her personal life. And it would have been a very tough day for Gladys today and, and I felt for her about that those personal issues uh, coming out in the way that they did must have been very difficult. But at the same time, uh, we do have an issue, and from a federal perspective, uh, we've had issues around land deals regarding Badgerys Creek Airport, uh, paying $33 million, including GST, for a block of land that was worth three, and then leasing it back to the same people for $1 million, and they happen to have given significant political donations to the Liberal Party prior to the last election. So I think that these issues and issues today at ICAC revolved around, again, uh, land around Badgerys Creek. One of the to, things... To be clear, there's no allegation against no. her. Has she done anything no. wrong that you can see? Uh, look, uh, that will be up for others to go through. I was on a plane back from Adelaide. There's issues with regard to her knowledge of, uh, of what was going on and Mr Maguire's conduct. Uh, but she certainly shouldn't be judged for the fact that she has a relationship with someone. That, that's her business, as far as I'm concerned. Consenting adults, that, that's no one's business except for hers. Uh, but I do think, from a federal perspective, I want a National Integrity Commission. I've seen enough uh, evidence about a whole range of issues, sports rorts and other scandals that have happened at the federal level, to know that uh, one of the things that ICAC has done is expose corruption. And we need a National Integrity Commission to restore faith in the political process. Uh, just to be clear, because Labor in New South Wales is calling her for Gladys Berejiklian to resign, are you...? Well, they conduct New South Wales. My job is to be the federal leader 
Sure, and to, but it's just a question of whether you agree with your state it. colleagues. I, I haven't looked at all of the detail, uh, but uh, I certainly don't think that she should be judged on any personal issues. I make that very clear. I know Gladys, I've known her for, for quite a while. I, I wish her well. But I do think there are real issues around her government and what she knew. You're obviously someone that similarly likes to keep your personal life private. What do you see when you see a leader going uh, publicly like, they, like she did today and answering questions, deeply personal questions, that she'd always intended to keep to herself? What do you make well, of that? Well, I, I think some of the detail that, that I've read, and I've only read it, I didn't see the evidence, uh, isn't appropriate that that detail be made public. It is not? No. But that came out as part of the ICAC process. Indeed, but it was connected up. Some of the, the fact of the relationship was always going to come up because they were talking uh, on the phone in these taped recordings about uh, events uh, where Mr Maguire, who, who I've never met, frankly, mm. uh, was uh, talking about getting uh, some pecuniary interest mm. uh, from it. But you think elements of what we heard, we all heard today, should not be public? Well, I read one thing in particular that I don't think uh, was uh, there's any public interest. What was that? <laughs> it's, uh, it was a term that, uh, that we wouldn't use on ABC TV. OK. All right, our next question tonight comes from Mick Lee in the studio. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying I'm a supporter of the Labor Party and of you personally. However, when your shadow treasurer constantly calls the, re the recession the Morrison recession... I think it's just just patently unreasonable thing to say, unless Morrison's in charge of the world economy. Um, so I think his his response to the recession needs to be scrutinised, but to just call it the Morrison recession, it it sort of panders to the worst in people, the the quick to judge and oh let's have a scapegoat, yeah it's his fault, instead of the let's be reasonable, talk about what's actually going on, and let's you know let's get a way out of this. So actually, it's not so much about that, my question. It's about, I think the reason that people are losing faith in politics is because when I hear the Morrison recession over and over, it makes me not want to vote for anyone. I don't want to vote for go the sharkies and I don't want to vote for Morrison re recession. So what's your question for the opposition leader? Discuss, <laughs> Discuss. and hide him. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the fact is that Scott Morrison last week referred in the Parliament on a number of occasions to the Keating recession. And there were other factors. That wasn't Paul Keating's fault that there was a recession during the, the 1990s. And the fact is also that last year uh, the economy was tanking. We, the only thing that kept growth going last year was population growth. We had wage stagnation. We had uh, productivity actually going backwards two quarters in a row. We had consumer demand falling, we had business investment falling, and the Reserve Bank continually intervening to lower interest rates and to say that the government needed to do something about fiscal policy to keep growth and they needed to invest in infrastructure. So I think when uh, certainly Scott Morrison presided over as Treasurer and as Prime Minister, there isn't a single quarter in which he has had trend growth. It's always been below what the, uh, the expectation is in terms of uh, 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 the, the trend growth going forward that's needed to grow the economy. And, but, but were it not for COVID, we wouldn't be in a recession now, would we? Well, no, that, that's, that's correct. But what we so, would So be, isn't it a COVID recession rather than well, a Morrison recession? The, the fact is that it's... Why is it legitimate to call... The Keating recession. Why is it legitimate to speak about Labor's debt as if there wasn't a global financial crisis? No, but this moment is not about settling scores. This is about a voter that no, sure. likes you, that says, actually, uh, the lines you, both you and your shadow treasurer are using don't really stand up. Except that we also have a Prime Minister uh, who walks away from his responsibility, um, walks away from pretend he has nothing to do with national borders, pretends that he's not in charge of aged care, which is where most of the deaths have been, and uh, continually uh, chairs a, a national cabinet that isn't 
really acting like a cabinet and isn't really national. So would you have more success in going after the government on those things rather than trying to apportion the recession, which you've acknowledged is linked to COVID, to well, him? Well, of course it's linked with COVID. No one's saying it's not. But it is uh, a shorthand that the person in charge at a particular time... I'll make this prediction to you, Hamish. Uh, when we have a first quarter of economic growth... If it is in this term, Scott Morrison will call it the Morrison recovery. Do you buy any of these arguments, Mick? Well, really, what, what I'm really talking about is it's not, not the mechanics of the recession. It's the reason that people are getting lost with politics. When I hear the Morrison recession, I don't want to vote for anybody. That's I, the I, thing. I and it's just the like you, you go straight into the mechanics. Yeah. It's just patently not... True. Look, I understand it's, the point a, that you're a making, but, everywhere. but, well, but using that term is not saying, is not dismissing uh, COVID. It's not doing that. Every, everyone knows uh, about COVID and the pandemic and the impact that it's had. And we argued for economic restrictions. Uh, it is just shorthand that the person who's in charge at the time, that's all it is. It's, nothing more should be read into it. But also, it's got to be said that during the global financial crisis, uh, we acted to intervene in the economy. Uh, we acted with a Keynesian response of infrastructure investment. We, we invested in social and public housing. We invested in public transport. Uh, we did give payments to people, including uh, pensioners and welfare recipients, uh, to keep the economy going. And uh, the coalition of the time voted against it all. One of the things that we've done during this period is to be responsible. We've been constructive. We've voted for every one of the packages, even though we had some issues with them. We said that super would be abused, and it has been. We said that JobKeeper uh, was uh, the wage subsidy system. Uh, we think that there, there's issues there, whereby some companies that uh, you'd be aware when you pick up your paper, they have 16-page wraparounds, but they're getting JobKeeper. They're getting public subsidies. Which, whilst, which companies are you talking about? Well, Harvey Norman and some of the biggies. That's the truth. They're all getting JobKeeper. So uh, they but, shouldn't? Well, I tell you what, they shouldn't while people in the arts and entertainment sector and probably the people who are casually employed here because of the nature of the industry who are operating the cameras tonight and are working on this program, many of them wouldn't be. And the fact is that the whole sections, casuals, so Arts and bit, just to be clear, works. you're saying Harvey Norman shouldn't be advertising uh, in the newspapers. No, of course they should be. But, so, but it so shows what's the point you're making? That the design of the wage subsidy system has seen a whole lot of people miss out who needed it and other companies get substantial benefit from it who clearly are doing very well. So, but I, I, I'm just not clear. Do you think a company like Harvey Norman should be getting JobKeeper for its employees? My concern isn't those who are getting it. My concern is people who are being left behind. People like the, 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 then why, then why the I mean, Donato workers. Because it's just... Because the government, the way that they designed the scheme meant that some people got it and some people who were casuals for 12 months working, uh, some of my, my son's friends who were working casually for just a few hours a week for a bit of pocket money, they got it. So they got an increase in their income. At the same time, if you're a single mum trying to look after a couple of kids, you'd been in a casual job for 11 months, you didn't get it and you just missed out. So the way that it was designed mean that a whole lot of people were left behind and that's something that we pointed out from the very beginning. OK, let's take our next question. It's from Oscar Dean. Thanks, Hamish. Thanks for coming down tonight as well and answering our questions, Albo. Uh, with government debt expected to hit nearly a trillion dollars, it is young Australians, those now and of future generations, who will be forced to foot the bill for our economic recovery. These same young Australians have been locked out of the housing market, they're faced with rising costs of education, have been some of the hardest hit in terms of unemployment amidst COVID-19, which will limit their career prospects and potential well into the future. Mr Albanese, what will you and your party commit to doing to ensure our young Australians have a hope-filled future? Well, the first thing we have to do is to address the issue of future job creation and where they'll be and to provide skills for them, provide training for them, whether that's support for TAFE or support for universities, um, some form of training. So we ad identify one of the things that we've said, indeed, the first policy I announced in Perth last year was the creation of 
Jobs and Skills Australia. So you have a body that includes private sector representatives, a bit like the model that we created for Infrastructure Australia, that looks at where the jobs of the future will be and make sure that we establish training to enable them to get those jobs. Let's just go back to the start of that question, though, which was actually about the debt that young Australians are going to have to sure. pay down. Are you saying, with the things that you've announced since the budget, that you're adding to that debt? Or are you going to be accruing less debt if you were in government? No, well, what we'll do is we'll put out all our costings well before the election. But it's true that the real problem I have with isn't the spending but, but, of but money. But the things that you've announced, is that on top of the debt that, already, that is we'll already have a whole by range the government? Of, we'll have a whole range of savings that we'll make, Hamish, and we'll make all of those economic positions very clear before the election. But my concern but will, is... Will one of the savings be the Stage 3 tax cuts? Well, that's one of the things that we'll look at. The Stage 3 tax cuts are $130 billion. Josh Frydenberg on Insiders on Sunday said that uh, he want, the reason why they weren't brought forward was they wanted to get bang for their buck. So they were saying that they won't get bang for the buck from Stage 3 tax cuts, in Josh Frydenberg's own words. Our concern is that about $80 billion of that is really at the high end. Now, if we're going to pay back the debt, but we're going to decrease our revenue and continue to have to spend that I think the government is going to have to do in, uh, in next year's budget as well, then you have to have a path back to pay back that debt. So, so we will certainly... So, so do you think that there's bang for the buck in the Stage 3 tax cuts? I think not? it's very hard to argue in the current circumstance for high-end tax cuts. That's my view. We'll look at the detail and we'll make an announcement at an appropriate time. We, what we said when they went through the parliament was that it was a triumph of hope over experience to say you knew what the economy would look like in 2024-25. We warned against that happening last year. And, of course, we know, we know that the, the economy has changed substantially. But, but this is a young person asking about the debt that he and his generation are going to sure. have to pay down. You're saying, well, we're not sure about some of these measures that the government is talking about. We're not going to commit to it yet. But you are committing yourselves to more spending on things like childcare, social housing, building trains. Yeah. So you're willing to sort of add things to the ledger but not take anything away. I just gave you a few things we'd take away in terms of the waste that's there, in terms of the Badgerys Creek land deal, in terms of some of the other wasteful expenses. Well, you're talking about billions of dollars for right. childcare and social housing. The, the land at Badgerys Creek, I believe, is worth $3 million and they paid 30. So we've got, there's a big gap there. The, the big thing you've got to do, Hamish, is look at... My concern isn't the fact that the government has spent money. It's that it hasn't spent money wisely. We've got $100 billion of new spending last week on Tuesday, adding up to a $1 trillion of debt, and that will rise to $1.7 by 2030. And you're adding to and it. And nothing, nothing to show for it. We'll, we'll have a range of... We'll have a range of saves. I'm not here tonight to announce our, our final economic policy because there'll be another budget But it, it looks like you've May. got about $130 billion to pay with, to play yep. with ahead of the next election if you're not going to go with those Stage 3 tax cuts. Is that a fair way of looking at it? Uh, that's a way that you could look at it, absolutely. But we'll make our announcements and it will all add up. We'll say exactly what we're doing on the fiscal front uh, before, well before the next election. There is another budget, certainly, next May. But the big problem is a, 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 a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. What childcare does is identify future growth. That's why we announced that. What, what was needed in last Tuesday's budget and what was missing was something that would grow the future economy, something that would add real reform. And during the last recession, presided over by Paul Keating, uh, what we had was compulsory superannuation. That's led today. We've got $3 trillion of savings. It's a ballast for the economy. It's investing in infrastructure. Real reform. Mm. What we had last Tuesday night was a whole lot of pots of money created many of which will be abused, many of which will provide savings for us that we'll announce in the lead-up to the election, and nothing to show for it, not a single reform agenda. There are three ways... Okay. Let, let, let's deal with one of your reform agendas. Let's take our next question. It's from Scott Cochran in the studio. 
So, Mr Albanese, the centrepiece of your budget reply was around reducing childcare costs. And whilst indeed there are savings for lower income families, it would seem from your own modelling as well as independent analysts that the big winners will in fact be higher income families. So would you acknowledge that the policy is more aimed at getting uh, the wealthy families stay at home parent back into the workforce than it is around broader income tax relief for higher income earners? No, what it's about is economic reform. And if you're on $80,000, you get 14 times the benefit if you're, on, if you're a family on half a million dollars. It, it tapers down. It uh, removes the cap on, uh, on, on the childcare subsidy and then kicks it up to 90% and then has a, a, a straight line going down. So, yes, uh, low-income earners, middle-income earners and some high-income earners will benefit from the policy, but the benefit is overwhelmingly for low and middle income earners. How do you justify, though, a couple on half a million dollars a year getting increased subsidies for, ta for childcare? Well, we had a, a question before about... Uh, the show began by talking about how a woman shouldn't be judged by who they're in a relationship with. Uh, the fact is, if, if you're a, a, a bloke earning uh, $400,000, your uh, partner... Um, shouldn't be uh, excluded from the workforce necessarily uh, just because of that. And, and this isn't... But, this but isn't... Are, they, are, are those female partners in the circumstance you described being excluded from the workforce? Do they need further incentivisation to return? This isn't a welfare measure, Hamish. Uh, what this is is about the three Ps, population, participation and productivity, which are the three ways you can grow the economy. Now, participation of women in the workforce is absolutely vital that we lift that. At the moment, what happens, a whole lot of women, if they work a fourth or a fifth day, and it could be a man, but by and large it is women who are impacted by this, uh, 80, 90, sometimes over 100% of their salary goes towards childcare costs. And all of the modelling by Grattan Institute, KPMG, they've all modelled similar policies. What the, the modelling shows is that for every dollar invested in childcare, you get $2 return or more to the economy in the form of economic growth. So this will increase the participation... I think that's the Grattan's women. numbers, the KPMG numbers, are not quite as generous. Can you tell us how much a couple on half a million dollars a year would get in subsidy for childcare under Yeah, your they proposal? get a, about a couple of thousand dollars. OK. And do you think... I mean, I know you're saying this is not If you're on 80000 you get measure. about $28,000. OK. All right, let's take our next question. It's from David Baines in the studio. Uh, I'm recently retired and an ex-Labor voter in a safe Labor seat. I'm unconvinced that modern Labor, in an attempt to reach the broadest possible audience, has the ticker to bring about the big-picture reforms of the past in government. Those reforms have not only forever changed Australia for the better, but the leadership, personal and organisational commitment that underpinned them was very likely the reason Labor was elected into government in the first place. So my question to Mr Albanese is, how are you going to inspire people like me to change my vote back to Labor at the next election? David, what is it about what Anthony Albanese says that isn't really grabbing you? I think it's... Um, I think the thing about inspiration is that it's a human emotion and you good, you've got to have the right policies in place, that's for sure, but you've also got to appeal to people's humanity and people have to understand the motivation behind the policy and they have to see the passion behind it. I think that's part of it. Anthony. Well, I'm passionate about equality for women and one of the things that the childcare policy does is just that. All of the analysis says it will lift up women's participation in the workforce, improve productivity, but also when families are making a decision about whether they'll have a first child or further children in terms of population, one of the things they look at is cost structures. At the moment, women, when they retire, compared with men, have about 47% of their super balance. They still earn less. One of the reasons why is because the childcare system provides a disincentive for them to participate in the workforce. That's why this is really serious reform that needs to be done. And it's consistent. 
with what Labor does in terms of all of the big reforms, whether it was going back to Medicare with universal health care, whether it be superannuation, universal, uh, access to education, the Hawke government, 3 out of 10 to 8 out of 10, uh, when the Keating government was defeated in that 13 years, finished high school. We make the big changes. When we're in government for a short time, less time than the current government's been there, the National Broadband Network, which they trashed, of course, but are now having to fix up and try and retrofit, paid parental leave. The apology to the stolen generations. I, I, Action with, on with climate With respect, change. Mr Governor, I don't think he needs a history lesson. He's already saying that he likes what Labor's done in government in the past. This is about your promise for the future. I want to be blunt. Do you think Anthony Albanese has what it takes to lead this country? Absolutely, I do, yeah. Uh, but I think it needs to be communicated in a, in, in a certain way. So, did you, I mean, do you watch his speeches? Do you listen to what he says? Why isn't he connecting with you? Well... I think you're connecting with me much better now. But you're I in think... the same room. You don't get that <laughs> opportunity all that often. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the distance of television makes it a little more difficult. But I think, uh, I think uh, bringing out the emotion and, and uh, being more passionate about what, 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 what you believe in, I think, will make a big difference. So you don't think Albo's a good TV performer? <laughs> Is that what I you're saying? I didn't say that. <laughs> I think one of the things that's happened this year, frankly, Hamish, is that We've been in an environment... One parliament hasn't been sitting. And the truth is that the opposition only get on the, on the equal stage when parliament's sitting. And uh, secondly, we've been talking about the sort of issues whereby people haven't wanted uh, to see distinction and, and, and attacks uh, against the government. People have wanted the government to succeed because we've been in a pandemic. So the political debate has been very different this year. But I assure you, I'm passionate about childcare, I'm passionate about infrastructure, I'm passionate about climate change, I'm passionate about creating wealth, but also making sure that it's distributed fairly. Do you think it was a mistake to play this year the way that you have by effectively stepping back from the normal role of opposition leader and saying, look, we're just not really going to criticise that much? I mean, you have a bit, uh, but not really play the usual political game. Do you think you've sort of disappeared from people's minds? It, it's been a challenge. Um, there's it wasn't no a question. mistake. That's no, the it's the right thing to do. Because doing the right thing by the national interest is always the right thing to do. And we're in circumstances whereby it just wasn't appropriate. Uh, so that we, for example, said with each of the packages, we said we have problems with issues like the super changes, with issues like the way that the wage subsidies were operating, a whole range of things, and we pointed them out. We put them forward constructively. It was Labor that put forward wage subsidies and were opposed originally by the government. They increased the New Start allowance, called it Job Seeker, and then the queues formed because that was a signal to business that it was OK to lay people off because they'd be looked after. These are extraordinary times. Do you think Scott Morrison is a better leader than you? No. Do you think he's done a bad job this year? Uh, no, but he has been... I think there are real weaknesses in his approach. I don't think he's an inclusive leader. I think he's set up a, a national cabinet process that began well, but since then he's been trying to fight with each of the state premiers who happen to be Labor. Like, it's OK to shut the borders of Tassie or South mm. Australia, but not the Labor states. Well, why then, on almost every count, is he so much more popular than you? This is because every leader, every leader, every state leader, you have a look at the figures around the, around the country, uh, all of the state leaders, people are uh, cheering on their leaders because they want them to succeed because they don't want to get sick and they don't want to lose their job. That's what's going on here. But when the test has been made, and it's not a hypothetical one, Eden Monero, we were successful. It's a really tough seat. At no stage on its existing boundaries during the Hawke government does Labor win that seat. And we won it uh, at what should have been the peak of the coalition's popularity. OK. I want to bring in one of your friends, one of your childhood friends. This is Alex Bukaritsa, I think is the correct pronunciation. What's Albo getting wrong? Why, why don't people uh, see him in the way that he obviously wants people to see him? It's a difficult question to answer, Hamish. I... Uh... Maybe they're not seeing the, the, the man that I know and I've known for 
almost 40 years. You, uh, you grew up together, you met on a bus, I think. We met on a bus on the way to Sydney University in a, in, just straight out of a high school and uh, we've been um, great mates ever since. Uh, that's, you know, almost 40 years. Um, I think, you know, to understand Anthony, you really have to understand uh, where his background and where he's come from. Um, he's had one of the toughest upbringings of any person I know. Uh, uh, his uh, mother, Mary Ann, um, beautiful woman, uh, single mother, uh, brought him up uh, in the toughest, cir toughest circumstances. She had not only the difficulty of being a single mum and bringing him up on, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on benefits, mm. uh, but she had uh, a crippling uh, disability, which was really severe arthritis in both her hands. Uh, and I know that from an early age, from his teen years, Anthony um, was uh, supporting his mum. Uh, he was uh, basically um, running the household as far as he could. Uh, and what's given him strength, I think, and, and, and made him a really tough person uh, uh, is his mother's great determination to give him the best possible start in life. And he, he's imbued of that. He understands what it's like to do it tough. Uh, he's got a great heart. Uh, and I just think the more people will know him, the more chance they have to interact with him, they'll know him, uh, they'll know him better and they'll understand why they should vote for him. Do, do you think he comes across as tough? Oh, he, you know, from time to time he does because this is, this is a tough game. Um, you know, he's, he, you know when, when the fight's there to be had, uh, he'll take it on. Uh, are you tough enough, Anthony, to be the leader of the, the opposition? Absolutely. I was leader of the House in a minority parliament. The first one... Uh, since uh, in the post-war period. Uh, we won 595 votes. Uh, we lost nothing. And uh, we... Uh, 595 pieces of legislation, a big legislation. People, people seem to think you're pretty affable. Most people in politics seem, you're, seem to say you're a good bloke. Well, you don't have to be nasty to get your point across. And, and uh, you know, if you, if you... But can you be too nice to actually take <laughs> on... Uh, a, a government and actually defeat them? Well, I used to take on, when Tony Abbott was leader of the opposition and had moved those, those motions every single day, it was my job to take on the debate on behalf of Julia Gillard, and, and I did uh, every single day. And uh, we got through an enormous amount. In both the Rudd and Gillard governments, I'm proud of serving in both of them. Uh, I had big jobs. At the end of the government, I was the Deputy Prime Minister. I was the Minister for Communications in charge of the MBN and media and the arts. I was the Minister for Infrastructure and the Minister for Transport uh, and the leader of the government in the House. I'm up for a big job. I've done it. OK, we're going to do something different, a quick-fire round of questions. I'm going to invite you to do something that most politicians don't and that's answer them really Quickly and clearly, yes or no, if you like, uh, but none of the sort of talking points, please. Uh, these are from viewers that have written in from right across the country. Uh, Michelle Wallace, will you ditch the third round of tax cuts legislated? Uh, we'll announce it down the track. OK, sounds like you're going to. <laughs> Kerry ann Toyer from the Sunshine Coast, what business, if any, have you owned or managed successfully in your career? What are your qualifications to lead the nation? Uh, in terms of my working life, uh, I worked my way through school. I worked at everything from, uh, from a paper boy through to Maccas to Grace Brothers to Pancakes on the Rocks. I then went to work for the Commonwealth Bank. Um, I haven't run a business, that's true, uh, but uh, I've, uh, I've come up uh, through my working life. I've always paid my way. Adam Bruce from Glen Osmond, South Australia. Will you set a different path for your party by renouncing all donations from the fossil fuel industry before the next election? I'm not sure we get any. I keep reading that. You do get some. Well, it, the fact if is... If you don't know whether you get them, you probably need to go and look up your donations <laughs> and well, familiarise yourself. They're all disclosed. OK. Uh, Deb Sullivan, uh, will the Australian Centre for Disease Control be branded the ACDC? I hope so. <laughs> uh, if Marrickville, this is from Rodney Todd, Marrickville is your home. It's been voted the 10th coolest suburb in the world. Uh, what are the 10 coolest places in Marrickville? We don't have time for 10, but the coolest place in Marrickville, please. Oh, Hanson Park Hotel. OK, and uh, you're probably going to get free beers there for the rest of your <laughs> life. Uh, Darren Bunt from Brisbane, what's your favourite Sabbath album? Oh, Paranoid. OK, there we go. Let's move on to our next question. <laughs> uh, it's from Liz Thomas in the studio. 
Thanks, Hamish. Um, There's viewers wondering what Sabbath is now. A black Sabbath. <laughs> For anyone that didn't get that, we need to sort of prove your rock bona fides here. Please, go ahead. Uh, thanks. It's clear Australia needs to transition away from fossil fuels, particularly coal, and move to renewable energy. Um, Joel Fitzgibbon suggested Labor reduce its emission targets to appease the coal mining community. Does Labor propose to soften its emission targets ahead of the next election? And will this risk more Labor voters turning to the Greens? Now, I've announced a policy of zero net emissions by 2050, and we'll have a path that's consistent with that. I'm the guy who has been around a while, who wrote our climate change policy in 2006 that we put into place from 2007. At the time, we announced a renewable energy target of 20 by 20% 20 by 2020. At the time, the target was two. It was a tenfold increase, and people said it would ruin the economy and it would be terrible, and we got, we got attacked for it. Uh, the truth is that we've now met the renewable energy target. There is now no energy policy. Uh, last year, there was a 50% decline in investment in renewables, according to the Reserve Bank. OK, and, but before you skate problem. away from the specifics of this question, we need to talk about a 2030 target and a 2035 target. You don't have them currently. That's correct, because the 2030 target was done in 2015. So, what, what, so will you have a 2030 target by the next election? Well, I don't think the government might neither. Because That's not what my will question, happen, will you? What will happen... No, because what will happen is that there will be a climate change conference before the next election which will establish probably 2035 targets is what the government will work through. So you will have a 2035 target by the next election? We'll look at targets if that happens. We'll have targets consistent with, we'll have a plan and a pathway consistent with zero net emissions by 2050. But and folks like Mike cannon brooks say you actually need legislated targets on the way to net zero by 2050 in order for the market to swing around behind it and make the investments. Do you accept that? I accept completely that what you need is, uh, is tar interim targets on the way through. Absolutely. So you know that, uh, be... that you need to take to the next election interim targets? Interim targets or, or a pathway, yes. What's we'll the wait... difference between an interim because target we'll and a pathway? Because we'll wait and see what happens at the next UN climate change conference next year... Well, they're, not, they're unlikely to do away with interim targets. No, but they w we don't know what they'll be. We will have a strong position at the next election, advanced, well in advance. We announced a very strong policy last, uh, last Thursday in terms of our transmission policy. Uh, I discussed but, those forgive issues. Forgive me if I'm misunderstanding something about what you're saying in terms of what you don't know. You do know that if you were to lead this country as Prime Minister, you would be wanting to put us on a track to net zero by 2050. Correct. So you acknowledge that you'd need a 2035 target. That's probably right, yeah. But they might decide to stick to 20... I don't know what will happen internationally. The targets have to be consistent with international action. That's the point, Hamish. And, and I'm not the government and we don't know what will happen between now and then. But one of the first specific policies I came out with was that uh, I have a track record of support for renewables, of support for strong action on climate change. We did it in government last time. We did it with a policy that, that I wrote in 2006 with Kim Beasley, the climate change blueprint. And last Thursday, we announced other strong policy, creating a fund, $20 billion, that will fix transmission that's perfectly consistent with what people like Mike Cannon-Brooks are saying is needed. Our next question comes from Stephen G. Oh, good evening. <clears throat> uh, I think you could show real hawk style leadership by saying that you're going to oppose the fracking of the uh, forests in northern New South Wales and the farmlands of northern New South Wales uh, in what Mr Morrison says is a gas-led recovery. Uh, Australia is the largest exporter of gas in the world. We, we export more gas than Qatar. We're up to our eyeballs in gas. So my question is, why would we want to destroy these environmental things such as koala habitats and, uh, and the farmlands to extract coal seam gas when we've already got tonnes of gas? Well, we shouldn't destroy koala habitats and, and uh, good quality farmland. That's, that's the reason why we have an EPBC Act that, that examines these things. Look, I think that the problem with the, the gas announcement that Scott Morrison had, 
Let's call it out for what it was. Well, Scott Morrison went to the Hunter Valley and wanted to walk away from renewing uh, Liddell as a coal-fired power station and he came up with this other announcement that won't... My problem with it is that it won't create jobs in the time frame where they're needed. The announcement that I made last Thursday is technology neutral. It's about fixing the transmission. It's about making sure that the I grid th I works. I think it needs to be clear. You're talking about the Narrabri gas project, aren't you? About northern New South Wales. And after that, it's going to be Queensland, where they want to frack farmland as well. Uh, do, do you think that Labor has a clear position on gas? Well, what... Do you oppose fracking? I mean, why, why can't we just use the gas we've already got? Well, we don't just oppose gas. That's no, not our position. Fracking. That, that's not our position. We, 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 look at, we look at each of the projects based upon the environmental well, assessments. Well, this that, one is... Um, oh, with that, respect, let, let the opposition leader answer. The, the, based, upon, based upon the specific proposals uh, which are there. So we don't say that there shouldn't be any new gas. That's not our position. What we do say, though, is that if you have a proper policy, you'll get uh, the, the market basically is driving change towards renewables. But at the moment, for example, with Liddell, part of what will fix up Liddell and replace that coal-fired power station is gas, as well as renewables, as well as battery. There's, there's a whole suite of measures which are there. Let, let's clear some things up, though. Mark Butler has said that we know coal and gas won't underpin continued prosperity in Australia. Is that, your, is that Labor's position? Well, Labor's position is that, that you need to transition towards zero net emissions by 2050. Yeah, we know that. You it's just about what Mark Butler, your you, energy you, spokesman, you, you has can't, said. You can't do that immediately, and Mark certainly clarified his position on that. You can't do it immediately. And the truth is that gas plays a role at the moment as well in things like feedstock, in things like the production and manufacturing and chemicals. Uh, it isn't just for energy on the, on the gas stop, although the, the gas stove, although that is an, an important role that it will continue to do for a while as well. So how are you going to resolve this fight that we can all see within your party between the likes of Mark Butler on one hand and Joel Fitzgibbon on the other? They have very clear, very different views on things like gas. How are you going to resolve that? But, but they also have consistent views with regard to a, a view that climate change needs to be addressed with everyone in my party support zero net emissions, unlike the other... But they're the not united on things like gas. No, the truth is that there are debates in a democratic party. And, and that's OK, Hamish. We're, we're not a homogenous unit. You'd expect that to occur. And you'd expect... They're pretty people... colourful debates. Mark Dreyfus is said to have <laughs> called Joel Fitzgibbon the idiot for Hunter. Uh, and other MPs apparently called Mark, Mark Butler as useless as a vegan in a butcher's shop. I mean, there's a well, big a fight of, going a, on. A bit of colour and movement, Hamish, that's all. But, but, it's the Labor Party. But don't pretend the... there isn't a big stoush it, going on about this. It, it's the Labor Party. And we go through... A, People will have differences of, of views. We had a debate but, but, before but with respect, about the need for more passion in but, politics. But with respect, but we all saw is, what that was like in government when you were in power last time. Well, hang on. We, this mob have had three Prime Ministers so far and multiple Deputy Prime Ministers and everything else. So you, you look at the but way they've responded. you're saying disputes over energy policy, we have that's been, just the Labor Party. We have been... Uh, over policy directions, there are, there are debates in the Labor Party over policy direction all the time. That's OK, Hamish. The point is that if you actually have a climate change policy that establishes frameworks that allows the money to go to the least cost, most effective proposals, then what you will do is drive the investment towards the energy, clean energy, that will create jobs, lower emissions and provide cheaper energy as well. And, and that's what... All the analysis says will happen. That's what the Australian Energy Market Operator, for example, says. So this is the operator, not Labor, says that it envisages that gas will be a very small amount of our electricity market in the future. It, it predicts correctly, in my view, that the investment will, by and large, go overwhelmingly towards renewables. The only thing that's holding back that investment 
is the lack of policy certainty from a government that's had 22 policies. So when in Joel Fitzgibbon says things that are not in line with Labor's position, we should just ignore it. Is that what you're telling us? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying I speak on behalf of the Labor Party, and from time to time, people will have robust debates in it. I don't seek to be a uh, you know someone who uh, says absolutely uh, there will be just one position, but George Christensen. And, and this mob, Matt Canavan, one of the things that I wouldn't be doing, they are funding at the moment a, uh, the proponents of Collinsville. Okay. Let's, getting let, money... let's move on before I think we're going to end up down a rabbit hole there. The next <laughs> question is from Wendy Q in the studio. Thank you, Hamish. Mr Albanese, during the last few months, we've seen a lack of cooperation and disunity between the states. If you were Prime Minister, what would you do to ensure that there was greater collaboration between the states and territories and a unified national approach to any future emergencies? For a start, I'd say the same thing in the room with the premiers and chief ministers as I said outside. The problem here is that the prime minister has uh, had these meetings of uh, the, the so-called national cabinet, but then hands over those decisions, hand over to the states, and largely that's because of um, Gladys Berejiklian and Daniel Andrews were very strong about school closures early on, and there was one Sunday which changed the whole agenda, I think. From that point, Scott Morrison went from trying to have a national approach to essentially having these meetings and announcing what the premiers had all agreed with and then being critical of them. And how, how would you get the borders issue solved? A, a bit of common sense would have helped. And, and not sniping, not saying, yeah, but, it's but OK. But doesn't the common some... sense need to come from some of the premiers? Well, the problem is here that it's the Prime Minister who's handed off responsibility to the states. He's handed off responsibility for the national border to the states as well. But, There's 27,000 the... Australians... But the states do have authority overseas. over their own jurisdictions. They don't have responsibility for our national border, Hamish. But we're talking, I'm talking about the state borders but, here. But that's the point here, is that the Prime Minister has given up uh, all of... Uh, he's handed over everything to the state. So, so are you saying that, that the Prime Minister should assert Commonwealth control over the domestic borders? I'm, I'm saying that the Prime Minister, had he sat down and worked through in a constructive way with the state premiers, uh, it would have been possible to get uh, outcomes that were more nationally consistent. But you're saying common sense needs to prevail. I'm just wondering what you think about, for example, Anastasia Palaszczuk keeping the border largely shut with New South Wales. I think it's the same as Tasmania. That's the point. But you don't hear about that, Hamish. Tasmania have announced some time ago that their borders would be shut until December 1. But there's no land border. There's clearly less people it, it, trying to move between it, New South Wales and Tasmania an economy, than there is between New South Wales it's an economy, and Queensland. It's an economy that's more dependent upon tourism than any economy in the country. And, and no one is critical of that. So I... I I just want a specific answer. How would you solve this problem of the state and territory borders? I would have been more constructive. The relationships have broken down. They broke down when the Prime Minister would say one thing in the meeting and a different thing out there publicly, when he decided... It's to all his fault. ..when he decided to divide rather than unite. And you could have had uh, far more constructive dialogue, I think, but we can all see that it's broken down. Uh, the so-called National Cabinet and a national approach. And that's because if, if the Prime Minister had been consistent, he would have been critical about the South Australian border being shut, the Tasmanian border being shut, as well as New South Wales, WA and Queensland. Our next question tonight comes from John Mapp. Given the government will have to pay for the deficit in the not-too-distant future, and the budget did nil for the self-funded retirees who, who are now living on reduced dividends because of the COVID, will the ALP commit to not raising the issue of taxing dividends as it was its previous policy? Well, I've already said we wouldn't uh, follow the same policy. I, I announced that uh, very early on. Uh, I think one of the things about it was that it was unfair to change the rules of the game to which people, perhaps yourself, uh, self-funded retirees, had invested with an expectation. 
and that it was a wrong thing for us to uh, to change retrospectively, basically to disadvantage people. Did you voice those opinions at the time? I, I, I unlike some, uh, keep my comments that I make internally internal, Habish. So uh, I've... Uh, I was just wondering how long your opposition to that policy dates back. It dates back a while. But, uh, you know, I, we're able to have debates uh, inside, uh, but... Uh, that was a decision that was made. It was it was made uh, for with the right motive uh, there, but I think we got that policy wrong, and and I've acknowledged that, and and in particular, I've acknowledged that uh, circumstances uh, whereby people had made decisions uh, wasn't really fair. I think that when you make changes looking forward, uh, they've got to be prospective. Okay, let's take our next question. It's from Adrian Gilchrist. Mr Albanese, I'm a, I'm a 38 year old with spina bifida, which has always impacted my ability to um, undertake full time work to the same capacity as my able bodied friends and colleagues. Restricting both hours, I, I can physically do, physically work and the work that I can actually undertake. Um, I cannot work from home as a result of uh, additional needs for, uh, associated with my disability. I'm on DSP. Since the start of the pandemic, critical medical supplies have been delayed due to both increased demand from the general public and increased uh, increases in price as a result of this. What assurance can you give me that if a disability bill or amendment that addresses this um, is put to Parliament, you'll support it. Done. Simple as that? Yep. Does that satisfy you? Well, I'll have to see. <laughs> OK. Uh, let's move to our next question. Uh, it's from Lloyd MacDonald. Um, yes. On Saturday, um, Kevin Rudd launched a petition calling for a Royal Commission into media concentration in Australia and the danger that that has for our democracy. Would you support such a commission? And if not, how would you address the issues that Kevin has raised uh, around the lack of media diversity in this country? Well, Kevin's raised legitimate issues and uh, he's within his rights as a former Prime Minister uh, to do so. Uh, he's uh, particularly focused. It's not a broad focus. It's on, uh, on Murdoch, on, on, on News Corp. And, uh, you know, it's something that, that we have to deal with. I think in terms of uh, we tend to get coverage that, that, in my view, from time to time, and I express it directly to them, isn't really fair. I don't think the front page of the Sunday Telegraph after the Ed Monero by-election, anyone who read it would have thought that the Liberals had won the election, not lost it. Uh, I appeared on the front page of uh, one of their, their tabloid papers a couple of weeks ago for something that just, just wasn't right. Um, but we deal with that. One of the things that's happening, though, I think, is that I think people read that into it. I think if people, if they watch Sky After Dark, they don't expect a balanced coverage like you get on the ABC. Uh, so I, I worry about, though, concentrating, I've got to say, as, as Labor leader, I, I worry about concentrating on the report, uh, the reporting of, of what we do. Um, it's a bit like complaining about uh, the referee in a, in a footy game. It might make you feel OK. It doesn't change the outcome or change the result. So what is it then? Is it bias? Is it deliberate bias? What, what do you think is going on? Look, in, in, in some cases, some of Sky After Dark is biased against the Labor Party. Yes, it is. Um, that's just... What's the evidence of that? Anyone? Have you watched it? No, <laughs> definitely not. I, 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 I tend not to watch it very much uh, either. But you look at, at who the presenters are, um, who they have on as guests, uh, what their coverage is, and uh, it, it doesn't present and doesn't pretend to present uh, a balanced point of view. And uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, it's something that uh, I, I often think that some of the petals on the other side of the parliament uh, if, uh, if they had to confront what we do in terms of coverage, uh, they, would be, uh, they would be somewhat shocked. And sometimes it must be said that the uh, 
the arguments put are picked up by the ABC and others as well. Um, you began with, you know, we've, we've been doing in terms of, uh, in terms of polling, um, our vote has been ahead of where we were at the last election pretty consistently. Uh, so, you know, that, that's just the way it is. Uh, th there's no point, in my view, in terms of uh, short term, uh, looking at, you know, just complaining about that. I, from time to time, I'm not Josh Frydenberg, I don't ring editors every day. Uh, from time to time, I, I do do it if it's particularly over the top. Over the Sunday Telegraph, I did uh, make a complaint. What was the story? The, the, it was uh, the front page after we won the Eden Monero by-election was ScoMo Scorcher, you know, Labor devastated, and the article reported that we'd lost the seat, and we hadn't. We'd won the seat, and I'd told journalists on the Saturday night that uh, I expected we'd win by about the amount that we did. Uh, but, you know, that's OK. Um, did you get an apology? You, you tend not to get apologies, but um, that's OK. I still engage. I mean, I used to, I used to go on uh, Andrew Bolt's program. Uh, Andrew's not someone who's a Labor voter. Uh, but <laughs> you'd, you'd go on and you'd put your argument. I believe in putting my argument. And sometimes uh, people will complain if I write opinion pieces in uh, News Limited publications. I'll continue to do so. I'll continue to take every opportunity I have to talk to the Australian public through whatever media vehicle, accepting that some of them have a different balance. And, and that's... A, that's, that's the way it is. OK, well, we appreciate you coming along to answer every question that's been thrown at you tonight. Uh, would you please put your hands together for the Opposition Leader, Anthony Albanese. Uh, and thanks to those of you in the studio and at home for sharing your questions tonight and to those of you streaming us on iview as well.